So a disease like sickle cell disease, you basically go like this, I want to relax on test day. No one ever relaxed by somebody saying, hey, relax. That just makes people more tense. So how do you relax? You relax on test day by being certain that you know that you are familiar with 90% of the questions you can be asked. So sickle cell is a model for how to prepare for your test because we will give you the disease and you'll learn how to answer the question, what is the most likely diagnosis? What is the best initial test? What is the most accurate test? What is the best initial therapy? Which physical findings is most likely to be found? And what is the complication of therapy? Then you can relax because you say, you know, on sickle cell, you can give me any question and I will be able to be familiar with that question or something similar to it so that I can relax. So you go, bring it on, ask me whichever one you want. In sickle cell disease, all hemolytic anemias can cause a sudden decrease in hematocrit. All sickle cell hemolytic anemias can have an increase in LDH and indirect bilirubin and increased reticulocyte. So by itself, this allows you to answer the question that it's hemolytic anemia does it let you answer the question that it's sickle cell? Even if I tell you that the haptoglobin is low? No, it won't let you answer that it's sickle cell because that just tells you it's hemolytic. Now why do you get a high MCV in hemolytic anemia? Because reticulocytes are slightly larger because they're retaining their endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. Hyperkalemia, does that make you know it's sickle cell disease? No, and the other thing about sickle cell disease, since sickle cell is a chronic hemolytic anemia, it's extremely unlikely to have hyperkalemia from a chronic hemolytic anemia. The acute hemolytic anemias would give you hyperkalemia. The same we have rhabdomyolysis, tumor lysis, hemolysis. Folate deficiency from increased cell production. Well, that's any chronic hemolytic anemia will give you a folate deficiency. So spherocytosis will give you folate deficiency because that's another chronic hemolytic anemia, using it up. So chronic hemolysis gives you bilirubin gallstones. The same with hereditary spherocytosis. Bilirubin gallstone, that again is just for chronic hemolysis. It doesn't tell you that you got sickle cell. So what form of metal will cause hemolysis acutely? Metal? A metal. Yeah, blood metal. Metal. Yeah, it's, uh, remember, your body does not like, your body does not like metals unattached to proteins. Transferrin transports iron. Transcobalamin transports uh, uh, cobalt, yes. Cyanocobalamin, right? B12. So your body does not like unattached zinc, unattached copper. Did you know that copper, like Wilson's disease, actually melts cells? Yes, it does, because it's oxidizing stress. So how do you tell it's sickle cell disease if they all see hemolytic anemias? And so the way you tell it's sickle cell disease, a chronic compensated anemia, okay, where the reticulocyte count is high, and the answer is because they have acute painful crises. None of the others cause pain. Now we don't actually know why you call, get pain with sickle cell. It's not actually sickle cells poking things, not so clear. Sickle cells blocking off blood vessels, not so clear. We know it causes the vasoclusive crisis. We know that uh, sickle hemoglobin sickles when you're hypoxic or dehydrated or acidotic. So we know that you sickle more when you have conditions of stress, but why do you have the pain? Not as clear. So the most likely diagnosis, we're gonna look for an African-American patient because 8% of the African-American population has sickle cell trait and therefore much more sickle cell disease, chest, back, and thigh pain. Why the back, why the thigh? Well, what's the difference between an ignorant person and an expert? Ignorant person, why the thighs? I don't know. Oh, ignorant, ignorant, ignorant. Ask me, ask me. Ooh, Dr. Fisher, why do you get thigh pain? It is not known. Expert, expert, expert. 
So it's rare for an adult to present all of a sudden, like, you know, oh, I showed up when I was 30 with sickle cell disease? Nah, it's a chronic lifelong disease. Because also remember is that when small children die in countries that don't have as much access to care, what you call resource, not resource rich places, less resources, I'd say, it's a nice way of saying it actually. And they die, they stroke out as five years old. So it, you don't show up when you're 30 having sickle cell, you know you have sickle cell. So the bilirubin gallstones from any form of chronic hemolysis, ooh, now this is a biggie because if since you have no spleen, it means that anybody with sickle cell disease that has a fever or a white count higher than normal automatically needs antibiotics because you have no spleen. You get osteomyelitis because the bone tends to be damaged. And this is a hard one for people because people are like, no, Staph is the most common. No, it's actually Salmonella. And so like most of this course, you don't have to agree with what we say. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to like me. As a matter of fact, on test day, you can be like, I think that guy's a bad man, but I'm gonna say Salmonella because you can trust us. When it comes time to test day, and you need to be there and say, I don't remember and I don't trust anything. Can I say salmonella and be sure I'm right? Yes, because in the published studies, salmonella is more common than staph aureus for osteomyelitis. You infarct your brain, you infarct your eye, you infarct your skin, you infarct your spleen, and you infarct your bone, avascular necrosis. And these are all the other manifestations that allow you to answer what's the most likely diagnosis. It also answers the question, which of the following is most likely to be found in this patient, which is a big question. So what else are you gonna ask for sickle cell? See, in reality, you're not gonna be asked, hey, a person comes in with a history of sickle cell and they've got pain in their chest and the back and the thigh, what do they got? That's too easy. Children, dactylitis, Dactylitis, more often in children, but dactylitis, interestingly enough, is a sign of crisis. It's also an indication for antibiotics. You're kidding me, pain, inflamed fingers? Yeah, it's part of sickle cell disease, inflammation of the fingers. You infarct off your bone, avascular necrosis. You infarct off your skin, skin ulcers. You infarct off the renal papilla. So therefore, you actually urinate out pieces of your kidney. Why do you get this? Because sickle cell damages your kidney. That's why when the question says sickle cell trait, what's the most common manifestation? The most common wrong answer is saying mild anemia. No, 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 sickle cell trait, hematologically normal. Sickle cell trait, hematologically normal. What's the most common manifestation of sickle cell trait? Renal, hematuria, isostenuria. Isostenuria, what a great word is that, right? Iso, same, stenos. Stenos is the ancient Greek, the Attic Greek for strength, urine. You can't concentrate or dilute your urine. So that's why sickle cell trait is the most common manifestation, is a, hem a uh, hematuria, isostenuria. The best initial test for sickle cell disease is peripheral smear, but can you tell the difference between sickle cell disease and SS and sickle cell trait from the peripheral smear. Yep, you can. Because on sickle cell disease, on the smear, on the smear with sickle cell disease, you have sickle cells. But in sickle trait, you get nothing. That's the whole point. Peripheral smear can tell you the difference. You can't tell the difference between trait and disease until you get a hemoglobin electrophoresis. The most accurate test and the only way to tell them apart is the electrophoresis. So the smear will tell you the difference. By the way, when you're in a live class and you say, how do you tell the difference? Can the smear tell the difference between trait and disease? Most people will be wrong and they say yeah, uh, that they both show sickle cells and the answer is no. The smear will tell you the difference. Now, what lowers mortality ultimately in sickle cell disease? About two things. That hydroxyurea prevents the next crisis and antibiotics when you have a fever. That's the only two things because hydroxyurea increases hemoglobin F to prevent sickle crises. And antibiotics when you have a fever because it's the same as neutropenic fever, where you don't wait for the results of cultures, you give antibiotics to prevent sepsis. Now, isn't this a beautiful picture? 
normal red cells, sickled cells. Gee, as if you know what a sickle look like. So this tells you automatically this has to be sickle disease because sickle cell trait does not give those cells. Now, what do you see in a smear in sickle cell? Oh, look, I don't see sickle cell there. Basophilic stippling is with lead poisoning. How will jolly body, that's when you have no spleen. How will jolly body, what a great name. What do you have? I have a how will jolly body. Bite cells is with G6PD deficiency. Your spleen takes a bite out of your hind cell, hind's body. Schistocytes is D-I-C-T-T-P-H-U-S, D-I-C-T-T-P-H-U-S, D-I-C-T-T-P-H-U-S. That's intravascular hemolysis, also known as helmet cells, fragmented cells, schistocytes. Three, four different ways of saying the same thing. Schistocytes, helmet cells, fragmented cells, or my favorite long word, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. D-I-C-T-T-P-H-U-S. Moriola. Who? Moriola. My name is Dr. Moriola. Ooh, ooh, mysterious. Mm, Dr. Moriola. Mm. Moriola are mulberries, the Moriola, and you see that with Ehrlichia in white cells, Moriola. But how will jolly bodies are there because how will jolly bodies are a sign of a person who's either anatomically or functionally asplenic. And patients with sickle cell are functionally asplenic because the spleen was infarcted off long ago. You don't need me to say you give them oxygen, hydration, and pain medications because sickle hemoglobin is pretty normal under normal oxygen tension. It's when you become low oxygen tensions that you sickle. If there's a fever or a high white count, white count higher than usual because people with sickle cell routinely have a high white count because the marrow is under stress and the white count is an acute phase reactant. White count, said rate, C-reactive protein, ferritin, and transcobalamin, ooh, acute phase reactant to white count, sed rate, C-reactive protein, ferritin, and transcobalamin. So it would be a white count that usually is 14 or 16, now it's 22. Usually it's 15 or 18, now it's 30. Ooh, you better give antibiotics right away. What will you use? Well, encapsulated organ, gotta keep it encapsulated. Pneumococcus, Klebsiella, Salmonella, Ceftra. Doesn't that look like the community-acquired pneumonia drugs? You know why it looks like community-acquired pneumonia drugs? Because it's the same organisms that can cause community-acquired pneumonia. Okay, but like pneumococcus. These are the anti-pneumococcal quinolones. Levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, gemifloxacin. Not Cipro. Cipro is not cover, uh, a pneumococcus. On a crisis, chronic basis, you're going to give everybody folic acid. And to prevent the next crisis, hydroxyurea. Pneumococcal vaccine, that's because people don't have any spleen. And you prevent recurrences by giving them hydroxyurea, which works by increasing levels of hemoglobin F. So you're going to increase the dose of hydroxyurea until you have, and the most common wrong answer is, waiting for less crises. Waiting till there's pain is not a good enough way. You're going to use the hemoglobin F level. So you're going to give an increased amount of dosing of hydroxyurea until either the hemoglobin F level goes up and dilutes out the sickle hemoglobin, However, if you give so much hydroxyurea, how do you know if you got toxicity? You increase the dose of, hemo of hydroxyurea so you have an increased hemoglobin F or you have a decreased level of white count. Because remember that hydroxyurea is in the form of chemotherapy, polycythemia vera is in the form of chemotherapy, essential thrombocythemia, essential thrombocythemia, yes, hydroxyurea, essential thrombocythemia, polycythemia vera. So now you're gonna get every question right. You're gonna get every question right. Because I've got it. What's the best initial test, elect, uh, smear? Most accurate test, electrophoresis. Best initial step, oxygen, fluids, pain medications. Hmm. Preventing hydroxyurea. Ooh, super advanced. So the hemoglobin F, it goes up to 10 or 15% or the white count goes low. Oh, 
person that has a fever, save lives with antibiotics. Exchange transfusion if they're going to have something that's life-threatening. Well, what's life-threatening or damaging? Infarcting your eye. Infarcting your eye. I'm not going to wait here. I'm going to give you exchange transfusion because I'm going to get rid I'm going to get rid of your sickle hemoglobin if you've got bad disease. What's bad disease? Infarcted my eye, infarcted my brain, infarcted my penis, priapism, the prostatic plexus of veins, infarcted my lung. When am I going to answer exchange transfusion? Eye, lung, penis, brain. Eye, lung, penis, and brain. Eye, let's say it together. Eye, lung, penis, and brain. Biopism, ooh, not too great. You get erectile dysfunction, it's really uncomfortable. If you've ever seen a mechanical decompression of priapism, it is really, really, really difficult to watch. I can't. Uh, and if you infarct off your lung, it's basically worse than a pulmonary embolus because the whole lobe can die. You can go blind. And children in resource poor countries, how do they actually die when they're small children? They stroke out as like a five-year-old. It's terrible. 43-year-old man with sickle crisis, with acute pain. Sickle crisis has uh, uh, AKA on folic acid because everybody who's got a chronic hemolysis should be on folic acid. But why did the hematocrit suddenly drop? That's much too much to just be dilutional. So why did he drop it? Because you can have an acute aplastic crisis. Now, how do I know whether this is dilutional? Well, it can't be sequestration. How come it can't be sequestration? Because you cannot sequester your blood into a spleen that is not there. Nothing's ever going to get lost in my hair. You cannot sequester platelets into a spleen that is not there. So here it very clearly says he's on folic acid because aplastic crisis could be from folic acid. So when you're on folic acid, what we're getting at is that you have what infection? Parvovirus. Parvovirus. Now the most common wrong answer is to say parvovirus IgM because parvovirus IgM is already a sign of a reaction into healing the parvovirus. Peripheral smear won't tell you anything because there's nothing you see on peripheral smear. There is something you see on a bone marrow. You would see giant pronormoblasts because parvovirus freezes the marrow at the level of the pronormoblast. But what do you tell first to say, is this a pancytopenia based on aplasia without growth? Well, what should you find on reticulocytes when you have a person who's got sickle cell disease? Well, all forms of hemolysis should have a high reticulocyte count, right? So if you don't have reticulocytes, it means your marrow is frozen. So the first thing to do if you want to say, is this a problem with loss of blood or something else, is reticulocyte count because sickle cell disease, like all forms, of hemolysis should have a high reticulocyte count, but if you have parvovirus or folic acid deficiency, the retics will shoot down. Because everybody with sickle cell should have 10, 15 percent reticulocytes. Okay, the best initial test to reticulocyte count, but the most accurate test for parvovirus is PCR for DNA. The most common wrong answer is saying IgM. PCR is the actual organism. IgM is a reaction into that organism. So PCR is like the same way. Herpes encephalitis, PCR. Is your HIV control? PCR, viral load. Is your hepatitis C control? PCR, viral load. I want to tell if you actually have organism. PCR, viral load. Tells you the amount of the organism. And the best initial therapy for parvovirus is intravenous immunoglobulin. 
Now, sickle cell trait only has one manifestation. Sickle cell trait, whether you call it heterozygous AS or sickle cell trait, all interchangeable. What do you see hematologically? Hematologically, they are normal. The only manifestation is a renal tubular concentrating defect, but there's going to be no symptoms and there's no treatment for sickle cell trait. The only issue about needing to know about sickle cell trait is that if they say a person's got hematuria, it's expected. Renal concentrating defect means if it's hot, you and I will bring our osmolality of our urine to 1200. But if it's hot and you have sickle cell trait, you can't concentrate the urine. So that means that the person with sickle cell trait will have a normal CBC and a smear and hematuria, but they can't concentrate the urine, so they're susceptible to dehydration. The best treatment for trait is nothing, because there is no treatment for trait. Sickle cell trait, don't treat a trait. Thalassemia trait, don't treat a trait. Alpha trait, don't treat a trait. Beta trait, don't treat a trait. There's nothing to treat the trait except love. See you soon.